chapter 40 as we continue in the series of messages from the life of Joseph. Today, when it seems God has forgotten you. The experience comes out of the early days of our nation in the life of one of the tribes of the American Indians. The Lord said that when a young boy became a man at age 12, in order to prove his manhood, he had to spend a night alone in the forest. This had been passed from generation to generation. Now, this little boy, loved by his dad, gently cared for by his mother, has reached age 12. His father and other elders in the tribe have explained to him what is to be done, and so as the evening approaches, the dad takes his little boy, and they walk far from the camp far from the sounds of the other children at play, deep into the forest. A forest that's inhabited by every manner of wild creature. And in the mind of a 12-year-old boy who is about to be left out in the forest all night, creatures that are even beyond imagination. Finding a particular place, the dad says to his son, Now you stay here by this big tree. And tomorrow, after you've spent the night here proving your manhood, I'll come back for you. And he leaves the little boy. The son getting lower and lower in the sky, begins to cast the shadows of the trees. And in that little 12-year-old boy's mind, he begins to imagine the creatures of the dark that those shadows depict. <clears throat> Finally, he sits down on the ground and crouches there against the tree knowing that at some moment the screaming of the panther that he heard that that animal is going to come down and devour him. Or the howling of the wolf yonder on the mountain far away is just a harbinger of the attack of that animal. An owl screeching in the trees tells him that he is surrounded and surely those creatures of the night are going to come and he's going to be attacked and he's going to be killed. And all night long, in fear of his life, he sits there wide-eyed expecting that any noise that he hears is going to mean certain death. All through the night. Finally, day begins to gray. A mist that is rising up from off the ground, filtering its way among the trees only adds to the horror of his thoughts. When out yonder just in front of him, he sees a giant creature making its way through the mist. And in his own mind, he convinces himself that it's some evil thing that has come to get him, perhaps some bear that's coming to carry him away. And he crouches back even further against the tree. After all, he's a man. He's not supposed to cry out. As a man, he's not supposed to cry. And yet his heart fluttering like a leaf in the wind as the creature gets nearer and nearer. And then as it breaks through the fog, he realizes it's his dad. And dad has never left. He's been right there all night long watching over his boy. Some of you have come here to this building today and you're living in that kind of a world 
a world where your heart is being oppressed on every side by fears, some that are make-believe, others that are very real. You're caught up into a world where your nights are long and your days are filled with constant complicating factors that rush against you trying to get your mind on your troubles and believe that there's not a solution to your problems. That's the kind of world that Joseph was living in. Joseph, that great young man found here in this chapter who was hated by his brothers, who was misunderstood by his family, his parents, who was sold into slavery, lied about and lied on by Potiphar's wife, thrown into prison and he's there in slavery and as a prisoner from age 17 to age 30 13 years of praying 13 years of waiting for an answer 13 years of living as a slave and being in the dungeon 13 years wondering where is God after all Joseph is a man of God Joseph is a man of faith Joseph is a man who understands the things of God Joseph lives for the Lord and yet Joseph is a slave and Joseph is in jail how long has it been since you fell into the, into the slough of despondency that you are in? How long has it been since you fell into the traps of the world and Satan and his clutches are ever tightening around you and you have sought God and waited for God and it just seems that God has forgotten about you and you think, where is God? when I am in such great need. Not only was Joseph in jail, but you miss it if you don't read carefully in the 105th division of the Psalms in verse 17 and 18, that Joseph also suffered in irons. You see, he wasn't just thrown into jail. And by the way, there are no nice jails. I haven't seen a one yet that I would want to spend my days in. Now there's some that are worse than others. And the, Joseph, the, sale, the jail that Joseph is in is not a nice jail. Here's the offscouring of humanity. Here men are thrown into jail and they don't have a public defender. They don't have an attorney who will come to their aid. They don't have any hope, most of them, of even getting out. They're just shut up and forgotten. And it's not just any jail. This is a dungeon that he's in. Much of it down below the surface of the earth where there is no light. The only light is given by some burning ember that has been left there by a guard who occasionally comes by to check on it. And now he is put in chains. They lock his wrist. They lock his feet in iron bands and chains. And he suffers. But it's in that kind of world that God comes to him because Joseph is not going to stay down. Joseph is the kind of guy that if you knock him down, he gets back up. Joseph is the kind of a guy that you just can't beat because he is going to find a way. And somehow, with God's hand on him, and if you read the scriptures here, the Bible tells us that the Lord prospered everything that Joseph did. And there in the jail, God showed up. He didn't take him out of the jail. He just made him the head jailer. God may not take the thorn out of your flesh. He'll just give you grace. 
God may not take you out of the situation that you're in, but God will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, Joseph had discovered that since God was with him and God would not leave him nor forsake him, that when he went to jail, God went to jail. And when he was put in the irons, Jesus was in irons with him. And if God's with you and God's aware of where you are and God can do anything, then God can take the darkness and make it into day and God can make your jail into a place of retirement with God. So every day became a God day with Joseph. Man, you can't beat a fella like that. Some of you, you've got a husband or a wife and you've got a situation that you just don't know how to deal with it. And it has become an experience like chains around you. I heard about a woman who went to her pastor and she said, I just can't stand it, I just can't stand it. My husband is mean to me. My husband don't understand me. My husband doesn't care for me. And my life is miserable. I can't sleep. I can't eat. And I'm losing weight. He has abused me. And the pastor said, well, why don't you leave him? She said, as soon as I get down to 115 pounds, I'm going to. <laughs> Joe is released from his bonds and now Joseph becomes the head trustee. He is the, the right hand man to the jailer. He does everything that there is to be done. The jailer just takes a vacation and lets Joseph run the jail. Now let's look at the historical setting about chapter 40. Because in chapter 40 not only are we introduced to Joseph but we meet two others. There are two men. One, we don't know his name. He's just the butler. He's the head butler in Pharaoh's palace. The other, we don't know his name either. He's the baker. He is the head baker in Pharaoh's palace. Two men who have choice jobs and somehow what they did we are not exactly told except Pharaoh fell out of favor with them and threw them into jail. One was there, he tasted all the food, he tasted all the drink that Pharaoh had to make sure that nothing was poisoned. He was uh, the man at the right side of the Pharaoh. But somehow he messed up. And the Pharaoh, maybe he just had a bad hair day. You know, sometimes that happens. And so he just said, you're out of here, guy, and threw him in the jail. By the way, his sentence was that he was to go to jail, but he was put on death row. The butler, I don't know, or the baker rather, I don't know, he may have burned the biscuits that morning. A lot of times that's a death sentence. <laughs> Fellow walked into a cafe and said, does that sign out front correct? She said, which sign? He said, that one that says home cooking. She said, yes, sir. He said, burn me two eggs and three pieces of toast and bring me some coffee that I can't stand. Home cooking. <laughs> the baker is thrown into jail. He too is on death's row. And here's Joseph. And Joseph is that man of God who goes about and he's taking care of all of the prisoners. Now, as he does, he notices one day that they were sad. Now, I'm going to tell you, if I'd have been in there at all, I'd have been sad. But these guys are somehow more sad than before. He sees them and he says, why are you so sad? And they said, we've had dreams that we don't understand and we don't know what they mean. And Joseph answered, do not interpretations belong to God. And so he said, tell me your dream and I'll tell you the meaning. 
And so he said, when the baker told him, he said, I had a vine, it budded, it blossomed, it put forth fruit. I squeezed those three clusters of fruit into the king's cup. He said, the three clusters represent three days and you're going to be lifted up and you're going to be restored back to your position with the Pharaoh. Wow, good news. Can't hardly wait for the three days to come. The baker took heart and he said, hey, that's a good word. Tell me what mine means. He said, I had three white baskets and in those baskets were all the finest things that a person could bake. And birds came and, and devoured the, the uh, bread that was in the baskets. Joseph said, bad news. The three baskets are three days. And you in three days are going to be taken out and hanged and birds are going to peck the flesh from your body. You talk about being sad. He was no doubt really sad. Two fellows had been on death row for about 20 years and finally one of them lost all of his appeals and he was to be put to death and they came to get him that morning and as he started out going to the electric chair his friend who had been there with him for so long and had become so close to him wanted to say something to encourage him and he didn't know what to say but he stuck his hand out as he went by and said, more power to you. <laughs> the, ja <laughs> the baker is headed to be hanged. One is shut up. One is shut out. And one is hung out. But what about the practical solution to all this? How do you maintain sanity, much less your faith, under such conditions as Joseph was in? How do you maintain your sanity when you're in a world where nobody understands you? How do you somehow keep getting up and going on when people are constantly putting you down? How do you maintain life? In this chapter, God gives us some clues that will help you if you can gain them to overcome your, dis your depression and your discouragement. The first one that I see is that Joseph maintained patience. He was in there for a long time, <clears throat> but he understood that in the fullness of time, God always comes through. You see, God wasn't late in getting Joseph out of jail. He was on time. God wasn't late in sending Moses down to bring the people out of Egypt. He had told Abraham, your descendants are going to be like the stars of the heaven. They're like the sands of the sea. But they're going to go into captivity and they'll be in Egypt for 430 years. And jo Moses did not come a day early. 430 years after they went in, God brought them out right on time. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God knows your life. God reads the blueprint. God understands where you are. And I want you to know, God knows your need and He is the supply of your need. If you, like Joseph, will learn to trust Him, to rest in Him, to be patient with Him, God is going to come through for you. He was patient. Now, we don't have much of that in our world today. We're an impatient society. Like the sign that I saw in an office over a secretary's desk said, Lord, give me patience right now. That's where we are, isn't it not? We want everything right now. We're an instant society. We're in a situation where we have instant everything. How many of you are old enough to remember that cooking used to take all day? That cooking dried beans was an all-day job. Matter of fact, I can see my mother now opening that package, filtering through, picking out any bad beans, putting them in the pot, and soaking those beans overnight. And then the next morning, by the way, ladies, you cannot cook without fat back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Beans ain't good without fat back or streakoline. I can see her take that knife and just cut little slices all through that so all of that good vein clogging cholesterol can get out of that and get into those beans. <laughs> and then she put it on the fire and it simmered all day long in order to cook those beans. We don't have that anymore. The reason we have so much noise pollution in America today is because every evening all them can openers go to work and microwaves start buzzing and, uh, and it's instant everything. We've got instant grits, we've got instant potatoes, we've got instant coffee. We hit a button and the garage door instantly goes up. We've got a button and we hit and the TV instantly comes on. See, I remember, my friend, when you turned the television on and you waited for it to warm up. <laughs> but we're not a... We're, we're just... We want it now. Everything has got to be right now. But Joseph learned patience. Joseph was a man who said God is a, a person who never misses and God's never late and God is always on time but we are a 30 minute society we have been brought up now on television where we can in 30 minutes see the problem and the solution to any situation and I mean throw in or take out whichever 10 minutes of commercials every 30 minutes of programming and you can have the problem the plot and you can see the answer. I want you to know that a lot of arguments last longer than that. Some of you have been arguing for days now over one thing. You can't even remember what it is, but you've been arguing about it for a long time. Mamas and daddies don't know how to handle children, and children think their mother and daddy have absolutely lost their mind. They're just not with it. We want answers, and we want answers right now but Joseph said I can wait since God knows I'm here since God is aware of my need since the Lord is blessing what I'm doing since the Lord is here and he's going to not leave me I'm going to wait on the Lord by the way the Bible says tribulation worketh patience so if you're in trouble, just know that God's trying to teach you something that you couldn't learn any other way. Did you hear what I said? Let me repeat that. If you're in trouble, God's trying to teach you something that you couldn't learn any other way. You see, I am convinced in my own heart and life that when a person is walking in faith before God, when a person is faithful in his tithing experience to God, God's not going to let you get into a financial situation that you have trouble dealing with if he's not trying to teach you something that you couldn't learn any other way. Some of you are in a, a vice right now and you're in a pressure cooker of experience that you feel like that you're about to come apart and you hadn't even stopped to say, God! What are you trying to teach me in all of this? But I'm telling you that God has a lesson that we're to learn. And in every experience of life, we're to seek to know His Word for our life. As a matter of fact, Joseph knew what Isaiah wrote down years later. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Sometimes it's just waiting on God. When you can't feel His hand or see His face, you can still know His presence. God will be with you. He was patient. Secondly, He was preoccupied with the needs of others. Now the worst thing that you can ever do is just get your eyes on yourself and have a pity party. You ever had a pity party? Most of us have. We, we, we say, oh, I'm such, a, I'm such a, a poor little man. Oh, nobody understands that. And you know who shows up for your party when you have a pity party? Nobody but you. The devil may have sent out the invitation, but you're the only one that came. Ain't nobody wants to be a sit around and wallow in your pity with you. And so he gets preoccupied. 
Joseph says, I'm here, and as long as I'm here, I'm going to make the best out of every situation. And the best thing I can do is I can get my eyes off of me, and I can get my eyes on those around me, and I can see Joseph every day getting up, getting a bucket of water and a dipper, and going around through the jail, bringing to those who are in need a little bit of relief. And by the way, the Bible says that even a cup of cold water in Jesus' name that the Lord is going to reward. And when Joseph got his eyes on those in the jail with him, when Joseph began to minister unto others, when he began to give himself away, is when he began to get back so much in his own life. I was reminded the other day of a lady that I met in another city while I was in a revival. I'd noticed her in the church for the services. And the, one morning the pastor said, I'm going to the nursing home. I'd like for you to go with me. And so when we went around to visit, I saw this lady. And I said, I've been seeing you at church. Uh, where, what are you doing here? Do you work here? She said, I live here. You do? Yes. And the pastor explained to me that this woman was a single woman. And she had sold her house and took the proceeds of the sale and checked herself into the nursing home. She lived there. She didn't have to. But every morning she would get up and she'd go from room to room and she would help bathe. She would help dress. She would put the makeup on those ladies that couldn't do for herself. She made an appointment with them and she'd go from room to room and fix those ladies' hair. And uh, she just became an angel ministering to women. I said, that's one of the most selfless experiences I've ever heard of in all of my life where people who could not care for themselves now found somebody who had hands that would say, I'm here for you. And if you're down in the dumps, if you're discouraged, if you're beaten down, if you don't know how to, to get up and face the day, start looking for somebody that you can do something for. Amen. Invest your life in others. A little less of me and a little more of others. He served others and he saw their needs. And thirdly, he prayed. Patience, preoccupation, and prayer. We're living, I'm afraid, in a world where we have been taught that prayer is like a computer button that you just hit and you get God to do whatever you want him to do. We're in a world where we think that we can command God. By the way, let me just say that God is not your little helper. He is God. So many people in our world today have got the wrong idea. So many people are preaching false messages that people are buying into. And they have God as some great heavenly Santa Claus just waiting so that he can just dump out all kind of stuff on them. And if they'll just get every sequence of the keys right and, and put in dot God, then that God's just supposed to do whatever they tell Him to do. You don't tell God. Pray. But most people think that prayer is a life preserver. You only use it when you're in trouble. Is that where you are? Or have you lived now to gain that experience where you can't wait to get with God? And you begin your day talking with the Lord. And you run your day as you commune with the Lord. And you end your day on your face just thanking God that He's been with you all day long. Do you pray? Joseph is in jail. But he knows God answers prayer in jail. How do I know that? Because he said, do not interpretations belong to the Lord. Tell me what your dream is. God will answer my prayer and give me the interpretation. Daniel, you remember, was the same way. The king called him in and said, tell me what I dreamed. He said, tell me what you dreamed and I'll tell you the answer. He said, anybody can do that. You tell me what I dreamed. He said, let me talk to my God a minute. And he went out and had prayer and came back and told him what he had dreamed and told him the answer. 
he learned how to pray. He was in the dungeon. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3. You ought to write it down. Our chapter 3 verse 33. Three threes. Jeremiah. Call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33 3. If that's not written in your Bible, it ought to be underlined, it ought to be emblazoned upon your mind. Call upon me and I will, I will. He was in the dungeon. They didn't like what he had been preaching, so they threw him into jail. By the way, have you ever noticed how many of people, uh, God's preachers were in trouble and ended up in jail? It was in the jail that God said, I will answer your prayers. It was in the jail where Peter was that God sent an angel when the church was praying for their pastor to get him out of jail. I want you to know the church didn't have enough money to get an attorney. They didn't have enough power to get some politicians. But they had enough prayer power that when they prayed, God sent an angel. And I want you to know if your preacher ever goes to jail, I want you all to pray for me. And get a lawyer. <laughs> but God sent a angel down and got him out of jail. Paul and Silas are in jail having been beaten and at midnight they begin to pray. Paul said, lead us in a song. God's about to answer our prayers and at midnight they had a prayer meeting and God came and set them free. Don't think just because you're in a bad situation that God doesn't know where you are. Don't think because you're in a problem time that God's not already on the way. God's got your answer. And He says, while you're yet asking, I will answer. He prayed. But there are some implications of salvation. Let me mention these and be done. You remember when He gave the interpretation He said to the baker, or to the, uh, to the butler, this means that in three days you're going to be restored back to your place. But as you are, remember me. Now he didn't remember it. When he got out, he forgot all about Joseph. Joseph's sitting down there waiting. Days pass and nothing happens. Weeks come. Months come. Nothing happens. Remember me. Years are going to pass before Joseph is ever brought out of the jail and released to become what God had for him to be. But God had a plan all the time for Joseph and the greatness that he was going to achieve. Remember me. My mind fast forwards to Calvary. There Jesus hanging on the cross between two thieves Here's one man cursing him. Here are people mocking him. Here are people spitting upon him. Here are rabbis coming by and saying, If you're God, save yourself. But here's one that says, Remember me. And just as the butler was released to paradise and the baker went to perdition, on the cross one thief went to paradise and the other went to perdition. Joseph suffered at the hands of his kin, so did Jesus. Joseph suffered at the hand of the Gentiles, so did Jesus. Joseph suffered because of the sins of others, so did Jesus. Joseph was numbered with the transgressors, so was Jesus. Joseph was imprisoned in order to set others free, so was Jesus and Joseph was exalted to the side of the Pharaoh and Jesus has been exalted to the side of the Father he is Lord one last thing please note that Joseph was a true preacher to the baker he had one message far different than for the butler to the butler, it was a good word. God's going to bless you. You're going to be restored back to the Pharaoh. Everything's going to be good with you. And everybody was happy. But I want you to know it was not a good message that he gave to the baker. You see, we're living in a world where people want the good news, but nobody wants the bad news. We're living in a world where preachers are trained to preach on love, but never on judgment. 
We're living in a world where people want to hear the niceties and just be good and try hard and God wants you healthy, wealthy and wise and, and God's got the best things and something good is going to happen to you and just think positive and everything's going to be alright. But nobody wants to hear the message that the soul that sinneth it shall surely die. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torment. But I want you to know that the man of God who preaches the whole counsel of God will tell you about the love of God, but he has to tell you about the wrath of God. He has to say that while there's a God that saves, there's a God who judges, and sinners who will not receive his Son will be cast from his presence forever and forever. It's a faithful message. And some of you here today, you're like that baker. You're just three days perhaps away from an eternity and you're already under judgment for the Bible says that they who believe not are condemned already. And folks, I want to tell you that you can turn from that one and get in on the other message where God's love is extended to all who will receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And some of you here, you're beginning to think there's no answer. You see, I know where some of you are. I know the health problems that have robbed you of your ability to work. I know the family problems that have kept you awake night after night for weeks and weeks and weeks. I know the difficulties that you're facing and the, the world in front of you is so dark and you don't know how you're going to handle it. You don't know how you're going to pay the bills. You don't know how you're going to be able just to keep body and soul together. I know that you're, some of you have been deserted by your loved one. I know that some of you wept yourself to sleep last night. But I want you to know my God knows where you are. And He will come to you in the midst of your need. Joseph, do you have a message for us today? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. The message is this. God went with me into jail. God was with me while I was in jail. God blessed me through the jail and God brought me out of the jail that's what God has for you bow your heads with me please